first of course uh, just for the people that are watching we want to ask you the basic question of what is your relation to uh, Reverend Gudinatusa? Um, I am his second child um, at the moment I am the eldest child uh, as the eldest daughter of uh, Gudinatumsa and uh, Tsahai Tolesa his wife and your mother uh, what can you say about um, their marriage and can you give us the story or the details of how that marriage came to be? Their marriage um, after my my father um, came to Nekamte in 1947 and wanted to continue with uh, his education schooling but he didn't get the chance to go to school so um, what he did was uh, then he got um, a chance to be a translator at the hospital. Uh, the then doctors in the hospital of Nagamte um, saw his potential and also gave him uh, education. My mother, who also was raised there in the, the Swedish mission uh, orphanage in Nagamte, was also working there caring for other younger um, orphans. So he saw there, he heard there, and uh, they met. Um, he hesitated for many years, as they <laughs> told me. Uh, but around 1948, 49, maybe she was willing to, to marry him, and they were engaged. Um, then uh, they decided to marry very soon because of um, an accident that happened um, happening that happened at the time. That means um, his mother uh, back in Boji died um, leaving his um, siblings behind and they were without any uh, their father or their mother and so they were left and his uncle called him back to Boji. So he immediately walked back to Boji for a week. I mean, at that time, it's only on foot. There, there were no vehicles. He went there and took on three of them back to Nekamte. And then he consulted with my mother. Then they decided to marry immediately to give his uh, brothers and sister a home. Uh, that was 1951. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, now that we've heard their marriage story, um, of course, after the years that they've been together, we've heard that um, Gudina and Tsahai's marriage uh, was one that was excellent or above standard. Uh, can you describe how this looked uh, and what was the fruit or how their marriage looked at home or from what you saw as a child? And um, what was like, what do you, how do you think their marriage affected you? Now thinking uh, back about the time, I think it was it was a happy family. It was a happy marriage uh, because of special uh, relationship they had. Uh, my my father valued the opinion of my mother. Um, he loved her and he cared for her. And um, my mother also cared for him and also took over more and more responsibilities because of his absence due to his work. Um, so they were always in agreement. I mean, the fact that she actually was willing to marry him and care for his um, siblings uh, showed that she was committed to him. He used to tell us um, in the background, I mean, uh, where he came from, um, uh, that um, he actually originated for a very humble uh, peasant family. Uh, his father had difficulties to feed his, uh, his children because he had to give uh, uh, a large amount of his produce to the landlord. So, I mean, his father was insisting that he actually um, works with him on the farm, um, take care of the family. But my father saw that other uh, children were going to school and he he decided to also to go to school. The father was against him. I mean, at the age of 10, he decided uh, to disappear, but consulted with his mother, who was very supportive. Um, 
So, in agreement with his mother, he fled from Boji to Nejo. Um, and this determination at this young age to, to actually leave his family, his uh, beloved ones, to um, some other area, strange area for him at that time, um, impacted him very much. Um, on the other hand, when I asked him why he ran to those schools, um, he said um, these people who came preached about love, justice, and this is also what impressed him. He wanted a better world than what he actually experienced as a child. Um, his sense of justice and the principles he actually um, um, integrated into his work in his ideas, what now goes around uh, the world, um, is, is coming from that source. So he uh, wanted a change for the people who were suffering in the whole country, um, be it from his, his village or elsewhere, far away in the world, and this has uh, very much uh, impacted him. The other one was, I mean, because his father died also um, very early, his mother had to struggle uh, quite a lot to bring up uh, uh, four children. And he, I mean, the relationship he had with his mother was very, very close. And um, whenever uh, he swears and said, even if Nazi say is alive, I wouldn't. I wouldn't budge here, and this is my principle, I don't do it. So he was very close to her. Uh, that's what and, um, I know. And she was also preparing for his wedding when she died. It's a certain day, she was not sick or anything, and she just uh, slept and um, didn't wake up. Um, so it has, it has impacted him. And uh, then the love for the family, for, for his siblings or for his children, reflected in there. He loved everybody and he took care. And his family was always a priority. The children or his, his uh, brothers and sister or my mother, and the family came always at number one um, in his life. And so he cared for us, that's what I know. Um, whatever he decided, um, or they both decided this was always in consultation with each other. Um, it was a happy yeah, family where everybody lived happily together. And it was always a full house with guests, with um, relatives and friends. You were speaking about how their marriage was one of where they viewed each other equally. They consulted each other in everything. What was the impact that Don Gutina's life and uh, ministry and what impact did he have on her um, during the time that they spent together in their marriage and after his uh, arrest uh, and passing, um, the rest of her life as well? How they impacted each other. Now, as, as I said, they consulted on every decision. It was in agreement and it was a conscious uh, decision they took in the family. Um, even before he became a pastor, uh, they consulted and she she said this this is the right way we are going to go together um, and then I think just a year after I was born then we all moved to Nejo for his uh, theology education and there he became a pastor and after three years my sister Aster was born there but then after we he graduated in 1956, we came back to Nakamte. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, um, he didn't serve very much, but then they said the church sent him to Hosaina and uh, to the southern part of Ethiopia to, to work. Um, first, she was willing to take care of the family alone, but then because the life there and the food and the, everything became difficult for him, so she followed him and leaving us all behind. Um, so you may see, I mean, even later when he, he left for studies in the US, and um, even though um, she could have um, joined him, she didn't want to leave us behind. 
So she took the responsibility again to take care of the family and, and uh, so that he could finish his studies. Um, to the, the last, what, semi last question on the topic of their marriage. Like you said, um, they got married to take care of um, his uh, siblings that he had to take because his family had passed. Um, and uh, I believe not long after he had brought his siblings to Nakamte and married Sahai. Prior to your birth, um, and I had a son, like you said earlier, uh, Emmanuel, and um, uh, a really tough challenge, I'll say, for their marriage as their first child did pass away. Could you tell us how um, this happened and uh, wh what happened leading to his passing? And after his passing, uh, you were born, I believe a year or so later. Um, how did the family feel when you uh, came uh, into their lives? When they um, married and until uh, Emmanuel passed, um, what I heard was she was working. So um, the, the lady who used to care for him, um, not a nanny, but somebody who lived there, was uh, roasting corns. So he was um, crawling a baby, a toddler. So he, he just ate from these corns and then uh, she wanted to prevent him, but then uh, it entered into his, his lungs. The doctors um, had to operate him. It didn't function, so they had to take him to Addis. There also it didn't function and he passed away. Um, for both of them, it, should, it must have been a very huge shock. Their firstborn, they lost their firstborn and then um, they brought him back and buried. And I think he was around two years old, two and a half something years old. And then I was uh, born a little bit later. So it has impacted them because the way they cared for me the way they looked at us all uh, was very, very uh, careful and they were always afraid that something might happen. I know that um, as children, I mean, until we grew up, um, for some times we were not allowed to eat roasted corn, corn so they were afraid because, yeah. You know. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very emotional story. Um, to go back to him as a minister after he had completed his second pastoral course in Najo and uh, after he served in Nakamte he was sent to Kambata I believe in 1961 or 60. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any memories of what the reason was that they removed him from his pastoral ship in Nakamte and sent him there and how did that impact you guys in the home as children and your mother as, as she had to raise five children alone? I cannot tell you on what basis they sent him to Hosaina, not to other part of uh, the mission. Uh, but they wanted to establish a congregation, I think, somewhere in Hosaina. He liked, actually, the job. He liked the people, and he was happy. It's, all, it's only the food, the type of food that uh, didn't suit him. So uh, that's why my mother went to take care of him. Um, um, yes, I was about five and um, I had to take uh, the responsibility for the whole uh, family and then I had somebody else and um, fortunately uh, actually my father also my mother both of them uh, taught me how to cook but the only thing I couldn't do is just carry it uh, uh, from the fire yeah. so um, as uh, the eldest child at the time I had to take her uh, Okay, yeah. After returning from Kabbata, Gutina uh, went into, uh, got an opportunity to go to the United States to study theology. And um, like you said, in consultation with Tsai, they made the decision it was best. What did home life become without him? What were the responsibilities that you took on as the eldest? I'm sure this was hard on you as kids. You had. You had just been separated from both of them for about six months or a year and six months. And now he had to leave again. Now, how did this make uh, you guys feel as children? 
how did it change the home life? And this was a longer period of three years and he was a lot farther away. How was it for your mother to raise five children alone for the longer period of three years? Actually, um, we're all happy that he was going for a higher education. Um, that's what he told us, that uh, this is going to be good for the family and we accepted uh, that. And um, also, I mean, life and um, working there in Nakamte in the congregation was difficult. And um, I was, on my part, very happy that he, he went. Um, at the beginning, people were telling us and also um, telling us that we'll, we'll join him. But that didn't happen. Anyway, we had our mother um, to do everything and um, she's a strong woman and she, she really managed. But um, at, it's not like uh, now there were no telephones, direct lines, there were no uh, mobile phones or anything, mm -hmm. no internet. So he wrote, I mean, he, he wrote uh, later and um, I I wonder, I mean, we used to get frequently letters from him. And I know I had my own uh, letters from him, which uh, unfortunately it was destroyed when they were, uh, when he was captured and she was prisoned. But to, he wrote us and uh, encouraged us on our schooling and um, the, the bright future we are going to face and that's what he did. That's wonderful. Um, to give it a more bright, give the interview a more brighter tone, we know that Gudina was a man of humor. He was a humorous man. Uh, we've heard from stories from different people. Gudina was big on jokes. Um, do you uh, remember him as funny in the home? Yes. It's, um, um, his schedules were very tight. I mean, um, um, as I said, we we felt it much, but uh, whenever he was at home, uh, he was present, hundred percent present for all of us. Um, and then he joked and um, ran around in the house with us, and everybody was allowed to present whatever we had. Um, but he also sang quite a lot, um, and he played uh, tr trumpet mm -hmm. and. Um, so it was it was a happy family it was and we were yeah. uh, laughing quite a lot mm. but these are jokes for the family yeah, yeah. of course <laughs> going back to uh, his time in the united states uh, when he came back immediately on his return he was offered uh, the position at the eecmy head office as the general secretary i would say your guys' life made a complete change like you said the brighter future ahead of you you guys were in living in Nakamte town, which is around 300 kilometers away from the capital. You guys were moving to Addis. How did you guys view this change? Uh, did you feel sad you were leaving your friends, you know, your home, the place you were used to and moving to a new place? And uh, how did it feel about the opportunity that was presented to him uh, to go and uh, lead uh, the church? For us, I mean, we were informed before that, I mean, we had prepared our minds. It was, um, it was a decision, and we couldn't uh, stay back without our mother or father. So we we joined them. We had to join them. We packed and moved to Addis. Um, the positive thing about it, and it's also we were five, and uh, we could play together, uh, all of us. But we also, I mean, um, we were also joined by our uncles who were at the university at that time, and they came and lived with us again. Um, and the family was together. Um, so it was um, a positive move at that time. Yeah. So you'd say it brought you guys back together as a family. Yes. That's wonderful. Me as an individual, I was raised amongst um, three Gudina family women. Uh, one, of course, uh, Tsahai, my grandmother, my mother, uh, Linsa, my aunt, Aster, and of course, you mine as well. But I spent a lot of my childhood with them. Um, from the stories they told me about him here and there, um, they told me about him as a special father, a uh, caring, loving father who spent a lot of time with them. I'm sure you agree with what they are saying, but how would you explain or define Gudina as a father to you? 
So I cannot compare him to any other else because he's the only father I have. Mm -hmm. so, so he was he was the only one very special for me. Um, I am always always grateful that he is my father. Uh, because we were very close. Maybe because I was the eldest child, I don't know. Uh, but until uh, his uh, days, I, I used to get also letters from him. Mm. The last time I met him was uh, maybe in Europe, 1978. Mm. We stayed together for some days and um, he actually he's a very open uh, man and he informed me that it's um, a very difficult time coming uh, to the country and that everything might change immediately. And after that also, after they moved to their new house and everything, he wrote to me saying that now um, the not only the political life in the country, but also even uh, the private life is going to be very difficult because of uh, what is going to happen. He, he, he foresaw what is going to happen. Mm, mm, so. mm. Um, you covered a lot in what you just said, a lot of emotional things. Um, yes. When Gudina uh, disappeared and as we later find out, he passed away. Uh, you've mentioned in the interview that uh, before the disappearance, he had come and uh, visited you in Germany. Um, he had mentioned, well, he had foreseen what was coming in the future. And from some of his writings and stuff, it's seen that he understood uh, his fate. He basically warned you guys about it. Uh, but you, I've, even after his disappearance, um, I've read some of your letters, like uh, the letter, my father, that you presented I believe uh, in 2009, Nine. Nine, yeah, 2009, you worked tirelessly to uh, search for him for 13 very hard and long years. Um, I knew that you were corresponding with um, the human rights wing of the United Nations, Am Amnesty International, and I've read some of your writings, very emotional, very touching writings, especially uh, the My Father letter, which is my favorite letter. What kept you going through this hard time? Because your mother was in prison as well. Sorry. No worries. No worries. It's okay. What kept me going? Okay. Um, what kept me going is hope. Because, and hope, but uh, on the other hand also to be there for my mother who was in prison and, uh, at, at the time. Because she was informing me, I mean, um, after he was in prison, she was really, I mean, through through the through friends also. But um, in her letters, she used to inform me whatever she uh, undertook to find him. Um, she actually <coughs> spent quite a lot of money because people wanted money because they they claimed that they saw him here and there and wanted uh, money for that. And um, and I, I sensed that, um, I mean, for her, the sense of living uh, is knowing that he's alive, okay? On the one hand, when I was informed uh, that he was taken, um, I knew that something um, must have happened to him because I, I would have heard it from, from friends or anybody. But then the way I was told at the time I was in one of his friend's um, house and uh, this friend of him, a German uh, now, uh, the, the bishop, told me that um, they couldn't trace him. So uh, the only thing I had was hope that we will find him, maybe in prison somewhere. And I, I imagined he might be tortured bitterly, but at least having him alive um, would make my mother stronger. But she also was in prison and even in prison and she said, please send money and they might find him. 
Anyway, I mean, uh, that didn't work much, so I, I um, turned to Amnesty International, the headquarters at, uh, in London, and pleaded to them. They already took his case as a prisoner of conscience, so they immediately took it and um, uh, also uh, demanded uh, from the Ethiopian government at that time um, and also from different organizations to look for him, to, to release him or tell the family whatever has happened to him. They couldn't, but then we had to turn to the United, uh, United Nations uh, Commission for Human Rights. And they also corresponded with the government. Um, but the government turned out saying he has joined the OLF. But then I also contacted the OLF, wrote to them and begged them that they knew. No, they said no. Um, he was never taken out of um, Ethiopia, so they, he must be there in the hands of the government. So it, I mean, it took me many years to, to look for him. I mean, it took me 13 years. But then, um, sometime 1991, I think it's in April, my mother and Lenza came from the uh, United States and Boru and Aster were with him because Papsa was born. And um, it was a happy event because um, in certain years, for the first time in the, in the family, somebody is born, not died. And so it was positive and they were all happy and we were together. But then my uncle Nagasa, Tumsa told, called me immediately on the phone and said, no, we have found him now. So you should all come for the burial. So we just bought the ticket and came back. Yeah, and then my mother and uh, my, my sisters and also my brother, Boru, all remained here. Um, and, yeah. Um. If it's okay if we ask this question, we just want to ask you, um, 1991, 13 years after um, your father had passed, uh, you and the family were together and uh, you had, uh, after you had your first son, Babsa, um, and um, Nagasa, his, um, I believe, second youngest brother. Uh, how did it feel? You guys, like you said, you guys were together when you, his brother, Nagasa, is. Um, I think middle brother in Nagasa, uh, second youngest brother, uh, called and informed you guys he had found a good dinner. What was the emotion of, amongst the family when they heard that news? I mean, um, after all these years, I mean, this was a confirmation and for, for us, it was a line now, it's drawn. We have to accept it. But my mother said, no, you cannot identify him. He might, might be still alive, she couldn't. But then um, Nagasa described how he identified him and that he was in his full clothes and um, identified also the fabric and everything. My father was a very huge person and uh, he was unique. I mean, among those buried in the same uh, uh, place, he was unique. And so his brother could ident identify him. And so we, we had to really uh, tell my mother that she has to accept it now. Um, yes, we accepted and came back, that's it. Um, coming to one of our more final questions. I think it's fair to say that you knew Gudina more intimately than anyone. You were his family, his first daughter. Um, what do you think is the legacy that Gudina left you as father, of course, and to the rest of us as a great man? I mean, what he left behind for me is, is me as a whole in my life. Uh, my sisters and everything, and this is part of him. That's what he left us be, uh, behind. But he also, I mean, even if, if he loved, he didn't um, uh, really spend much money. He told us to, to get our education and be independent as soon as possible. Um, I know my, my, my education was paid by my aunt, his sister, um, until I, I finished the 12th school. 
uh, but then he told me at the age of 18 you are now independent you have to be self-reliant no money from home anymore so i became self-reliant i had to work and then also uh, got a scholarship and went but still uh, i mean i didn't expect uh, material from him but the emotional this uh, close relationship and exchange um, it was it was always very strong and that's what uh, what I, I i loved about him and also his relationship to his sisters and especially to baro was very close um, sometimes you think they are father and child but other times they are um, mental um, mentally the, on the same line and they always talk uh, they always listen news together they analyze the situation um, not here in the all in the country but also all over the world they exchange and so they also bring in people into our homes and exchange ideas and get information also from the people um, I mean at times we were about I mean 17 people in the home because we always had I mean my father or later on Baro or Nagasa brought uh, visitors with them and it was full house um, my mother had to really take care of everything and um, that uh, everybody was uh, got their uh, their part and they were uh, taken care of and she was uh, very strong and sometimes I remember and she didn't have anything at home but my father um, brought people and said uh, Zahai they are hungry do you have anything at home and but it was still she was a loving and um, we shared everything that's what I, I, I liked about him he shared whatever we had with people and then unlike, I mean, the culture in this country, uh, what I still um, detest, um, he invited also his driver or anybody who was, um, um, I mean, uh, the, the people who were serving in the house, everybody had to eat at the same table. Yeah. Um, so there was no uh, no difference between people for him and uh, he talked to everybody especially the youth and the, the poor people he listened um, this was his character and uh, I I think back positively when I, uh, I think about him the way he brought us our outlook our belief and everything influenced me the way I brought up my children, and the way I lead my marriage and everything, and I, I got it from him and from my mother also. And um, the last question that we have for you is, do you have any future plans to maintain and share Gudina's legacy with the rest of the world? So, mm -hmm. uh, I really don't know whether I have uh, that much time. <laughs> But um, whatever I can do, um, I have you saw now. I mean, I have shared it with you, and then still I'm um, working on it on the documentation of his um, work and his legacy. And I'm still getting uh, whatever he wrote to people um, privately or anything. Uh, so I'll document that. But whatever people would like to know or learn from his life and his work, I'm ready yeah. to do. That. We want to thank you very much for sharing with us yeah, such deep pleasure. personal stories. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.